rhetoric of all kinds, including digital rhetoric, are at the heart of um, uh, politics of all varieties. When I'm trying to talk kind of to other academics, I actually struggle sometimes with why is digital rhetoric important. Where I try to, to draw them in is on the, the sort of political orientation. I think 2016 has made that a lot easier. You know, our president is a Twitter troll, like, it's very clear how there's no way right now to do politics without understanding the complexity of digital spaces. I don't think you can teach digital rhetoric without paying attention to it. And I, I think you need to kind of be overt about it. Especially after the 2016 election, they're like, yes, this is important. We all need to be paying more attention to it. In 2013, I started writing on algorithms. I had most of my department asking me, who cares about algorithms? After 2016, I, I haven't gotten that question ever. In every single way. Rhetoric and democracy are sort of impossible to split apart, right? Um, and so I think politics is an important component of digital rhetoric and it's an important field of study. I would argue that you can't separate the two. I can't think of a way they don't. If you're doing digital rhetoric and not talking about politics, uh, it's not possible, basically. I don't think you can talk about digital rhetoric without having some political implications, whether you explicitly acknowledge that or not. I'd say in every way, <laughs> in politics, I think are really, really central to digital rhetorics. I'm really skeptical of any digital work that doesn't engage politics. I think it's hard to, especially today, to disentangle politics with anything. It depends on how we define politics. I think we need to think about politics with a big P politics and a little P politics. Uh, if we think about politics in sort of the, the governmental structure sense, obviously it's important, but I think of politics a little bit more broadly. Political with a small P, which is really about the exercise of power. The sort of power exchanges and, and ways that we negotiate power. Because whether you're talking about micro-level power, whether it's interpersonal power, um, how that's reflected on with interactions and self-presentation on social media, or power at the more discursive level, like how the way that people talk on social media re entrenches certain forms of power, resists certain forms of power. I think about things like how much um, ideas about technologies were used even to kind of justify colonization of various groups of people, and so I think that they're intimately connected, and I think that there's growing recognition, even publicly, about these types of issues with books like Algorithms of Oppression, Automating Inequality, um, Technically Wrong, and things like that. So I think actually digital rhetoric has been part of politics for a while. We simply haven't paid attention. Now we're paying attention. I think uh, the essence of digital rhetoric is uh, the space in which it happens. It's not just the way that we communicate in digital spaces, it's also the spaces themselves and how they have been constructed. The construction of an interface, the construction of any sort of material or machine, um, and I'm thinking of, of Winner here in particular, that every artifact has politics. What the interface, what that allows you to enter, is a space that we haven't fully attended to as we might, and a space that is shaping us without our even being aware of it as we speak. Ultimately, digital rhetoric or digital technologies are still being predominantly produced by straight white dudes. So that means that it is excluding a lot of different identities in different spaces. We need more narratives from marginalized groups who are experiencing spaces that are often designed by white men. I'm thinking of like Lee Gruel's article on Wikipedia, you know, like the, the line, it, it reeks like a boy's locker room in here. So we need stories from people who are experiencing these digital spaces that are not necessarily invited to them or they're not designed for them, especially in mind. We've really got to start talking about how all of these um, platforms and all of these products are gendered first and then determine whether or not they're useful. Once I'd read a piece about how women gossip online and men produce content. Legitimate journalism, right? That women talk and women chat and women make relationships but men make content. Um, that stings for me. Right, um, what, and so what content creation is and what tools there are for con content creation, I think we need to look at that intersectionally. With digital rhetoric though, uh, we have additional things that might be influencing people, um, like for example, uh, a sorting algorithm that might be 
on social media. I really advocate for audience research and sort of ethnographic research that understands the meaning that people bring to bear on internet content and internet platforms and technologies and how that is structured, not necessarily just by the content, but also by the audience member themselves and what they're bringing to bear on the interaction. They may not necessarily think of those tools in rhetorical ways, but once you point out that those tools are exerting influence uh, on them and in the ways that they use them on others, then usually the students pick up on it really quickly and are able to see that influence in really easy ways. Now, you, you know, just because you don't bank online or just because you don't shop online doesn't mean that you're not part of an entire networked apparatus. And the idea that there's a online self and an offline self, that you can't, you can't. There's a whole network that controls your traffic signals. The way you try to showcase it or persuade people of its value is by figuring out who the people are and choosing the appropriate strategy. Different, I mean, to link it to Aristotle is not going to do much for your average 18-year-old, okay? But to link it to something like Heartland or Me Too or Black Lives Matter, that then, then you make the linkage and, and they see it right away. What I like so much about talking with people about how they use social media is that they do weird things. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just like things that no one intended, like the, the designers of the platforms definitely didn't intend to happen. That's where you can find invention. How are people who are maybe like really targeted in these spaces in terms of like being surveilled, like being policed, uh, how are these people using these spaces in like super creative ways in spite of all these constraints? And I think that can help us think like more productively about politics and digital rhetoric as well, because we're not just thinking about like sort of uh, traditional like liberal politics. We're thinking about like a more radical orientation, I guess, to like what can happen in digital spaces. We've got to get those stories out. We have to listen to our our protesters and our activists and our actors, and we have to find out what they're trying to do, um, and then we have to find out what impacts, how impactful their work is, and why they think it is. We just need to do more listening to the narratives instead of our like the ethnographic sort of analyzing what someone has done and then deciding if it's successful. I mean, the Parkland thing, like the Women's March, although even more so, that particular narrative is um, unique in its efficacy. There has never been a case of a school shooting that eventuated um, a year and two weeks later in a bill passing the House of Representatives, so it's unique. I think the intervention for digital rhetoricians is then how can we use certain methods to analyze the networks and to analyze even just like certain patterns and linguistic, like tracing linguistic patterns and tracing different like social media accounts uh, to really kind of um, figure out for a certain slice of the internet, you know, what the impact is or, or what's happening. So I think some of the methods that we should be thinking about are compiling, uh, making visible, tracing, mapping, um, and uh, doing that in ways that teach us something and that uh, show us a way forward. Because that's what a map does, right, is, is it shows us a way. I think probably getting a better handle both on its uh, threats, the, the threat that, that these various systems constitute, both to us as individuals but to us as collective entities who are committed to certain principles, um, and to understand its potential. I'll give you an example of something that we're not doing that someone else is that we might consider. Emily, I don't know how to say her last name, Gorsinski, Gorchinsky, uh, she is a transgender activist uh, from, uh, from Charlottesville. She was at the scene of the, um, the murder of the activist by the guy in the car, right? Um, and she has essentially been run out of the country by white supremacists. Um, and so she's working out of Ber Berlin now. And something that she has been working on uh, since Charlottesville in 2017, the fall of 2017, is creating a site that tracks uh, court cases in the United States. The focus of those court cases are criminals, people accused of crimes who are in these uh, uh, white supremacist, white nationalist uh, groups. What her compiling of that data shows and tracking of that shows is the uh, fact that this is actually a really vast problem in our country. 
Um, and so to use uh, digital media, uh, not only to track it, so she uses you know, the internet to, to go and log into court cases or log into court sites or county websites or whatever it is, uh, to try to uh, sort through this stuff and then display it uh, for end users, um, that's a kind of model that we might look at uh, to think about how we can employ digital tools in a kind of activist or mapping model. Um, we have a group of tech-savvy politicians. I feel like the ways that digital rhetoric are being used by these politicians are often manipulative. It's taking complex ideas and oversimplifying them to make our students aware that it's happening. It's extremely important. In fact, I think it may be probably one of the most pressing questions in our democracy right now. How do we understand that how these digital tools are being used? And how do we make sure that others understand how these digital tools are being used? And possibly, how do we regulate how these digital tools can be used? It's, it's the question of, of manipulation, disinformation, um, the, the Russian IRA propaganda efforts. Uh, it's, it's where the political import is most obvious. It's where we have the least training and we really need more training. Um, and it's where I think the future of, of sort of our technological spaces is going to be negotiated. Thinking about what is disinformation? What is fake news? How do we combat it? Can we combat it? What's going on with uh, political campaigns, use of uh, digital spaces? Like what's going on with like trolling and what's going on with like Russian interference and bots. Um, I think those are the conversations that are like very visible in digital rhetorics right now. Uh, but to me, the most important question is the, the question that can sometimes go invisible in those conversations, which is like in this work and in this grappling with really complex spaces, like who's being centered and is it the people who are most affected by the ways that this could go wrong. So are we centering the people whose like bodies are most impacted by trolling? Like, are we thinking about like in terms of political rhetoric and politicians' use of social media, um, who might be especially um, impacted and also who might be especially well equipped to come up with ways to counter all the messed up stuff that's going on? What, what has really captured my attention um, for the past couple of years is how what we're not seeing actually is itself very much political. Uh, and that is to say that we are not being allowed to see certain things, how Facebook's algorithm works, for instance. And I think that in and of itself is a political matter that, um, you know, we're going to have to address. The, the sort of algorithmic level, at least me personally, I, ha I, I don't have much understanding of how that works. And part of that is by design. Um, a lot of algorithms, you know, they're proprietary, right? You're not supposed to know how it works. I think we should be attending much more carefully to analytics and predictive analytics in particular. Uh, I mean, we're at a moment where st we're studying digital rhetoric without knowing basically anything about how data online is collected, used, analyzed. It, it strikes me a bit as trying to do uh, tobacco research in the 60s and 70s or something, or trying to do research on gun violence in the 90s. I mean, you just don't have access to the things that would make for the most useful um, study of something. One of the things that my discipline is very concerned about is the fact that the people with the most access to data about what's going on online are the big tech platforms, and they're very disincentivized to share that with anybody, especially after the um, scandal over the emotional contagion experiment using Facebook data. This means that the people who have the best understanding of what's going on in social media are researchers at Facebook, Twitter, Google, etc., but they're often not allowed to publish their studies in any kind of public way. They are also not necessarily governed by the same type of ethics that we are in university settings. That means that there's an enormous inequality between the type of work we can do. Often a study that's done in academia will be criticized because it's not working with the type of data that somebody who worked at a social platform would have access to, but we cannot get that data. And in many cases, we are in what Dean Freeland calls a post-API 
uh, phase of social media research in which many places like Twitter or YouTube are shutting down public access to any of their data, which makes it even more difficult for us to come up with proxy studies to study things that we're interested in. So one of the things that I think we hope to see is more collaboration between social platforms and academic researchers. So obviously power is, 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 is something you always have to consider in digital rhetorics. Um, if we take power um, off the table sort of as this big overbearing concept and we talk sort of more sort of current affairs politics, um, then uh, it's, 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 it, that sort of becomes just another topic, another genre um, that you can analyze. I suppose I just worry that we um, might spend so much time attending to the uh, awfulness of politics at the national level that we um, don't attend quite as well as we might to politics at the local level. For most of my life, I consider myself a political person. I came to this country as a student, um, an international student. I was on a student visa for a very long time. Uh, I got my green card last year. I grew up in, in uh, you know, a uh, I'm not say dictatorship, but authoritarian government, um, and that we had different voting mechanisms and stuff like that. And entering to the field, and especially with what has happened, you know, over the last few years, um, thinking about my position as a writing teacher um, and, and rhetoric teacher, the responsibility of um, accounting for the political discourses. Um, especially on digital platforms. I feel like it's my responsibility to sort of talk to students about that, right? Um, but I also feel uh, very weird about it um, because I am not allowed to vote. Um, and I don't know what I, I, what I do um, in relation to political engagement or discourse how any of that actions or involvement can have what kinds of impacts on me in my life. So I feel like I'm very privileged. Um, I've not experienced a lot of discrimination that a lot of immigrants have experienced, especially non-documented. I've not had any of that. Um, but I still feel that little fear that somebody, you know, someday is going to kick me out. You know, um, and so I'm still struggling with that. I don't. I think it's really, really important um, to talk about um, politics in relation with digital media, but personally, how to really enact that um, is like a big question mark, like above my head every day. I think that's where people see that um, see digital rhetoric working in the world, right? Either because so much of our conversation around politics um, happens in digital spaces. And that's, that's sort of move, moving more there. And it's not as simple as like, this is the new public sphere, right? Because there's not one, right? There's a million and they're, everyone has their own. So understanding all these different aspects of the digital world, I think is very important for young people, especially those in the sort of college environment.